Welcome to the Barbarian Hour podcast, where we conquer the impossible. The Barbarian Hour podcast is presented by Barbarian Apparel. Here is Jared Opfer and Zeb Miller. Are you ready? Okay, so we'll get started here with Coach Borelli. Coach Jason Borelli, Coach Borelli's first year head coach at American University. Coach Borelli was previously the head coach at Stanford. Coach Borelli, how many years were you at Stanford as the head coach? I was the head coach there for 13 years, but I was there 14 years total. So, so Coach McCoy, you were Coach McCoy's assistant for a year. He leaves. You're right in there as, as the, the head coach for Stanford for 13 years. Holy smokes. Wow. Time goes really fast, like really fast. Wow. So 13 years out on the West Coast. And did you live there for, for 14 years then? Yeah, I moved there in July of 2007. And we we moved out uh, in, well, I guess technically I drove out in June of 2021. So uh, four, almost just shy of 14 years I lived there. Yeah. So did you leave right from Mount Pleasant or were you coaching somewhere else before that? No, I was on my dad's staff at Central Michigan. So I was a I was a true townie, Zeb. I I uh, I went to elementary school, middle school, high school, college, all in the same town. So. Did you ever live up north? Okay, so for people who don't know, up north is anywhere past about, well, basically past Mount Pleasant, probably an hour within forty five minutes, an hour north of Mount Pleasant is considered up north in Michigan. Is that is that a correct assessment? Or what I, is that basically it? Yeah, that's, that's a, probably a fair assessment. Yeah, there's not much, there's a, it's beautiful country once you start getting north of Michigan. And then if you cross the, the Mackinac bridge, the mighty Mac, um, you know, you get into God's country up there and it's, it's beautiful. But when we, when my dad coached at Lake Superior state division two school, uh, he did, he was there for five years. I was in, uh, I was kindergarten through fourth grade in, in, uh, Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, which is right on the Canadian border. I mean, we were, you know, a mile away from the bridge going into Canada. So, so you were north of Mackinac Bridge another forty-five minutes or an hour? No, oh, a solid hour. Hour. Holy here. smokes! Wow, you were way up there. So you went there through four, fourth grade. You said, "Yep." So that was that was as a kid. I think looking back on it now, I don't have any idea how we pulled that off, but as kids, you didn't even think about it. You know, uh, I loved every minute of it. You know, that was, you know, just some of the best memories I have because so much snow, so much things, so many things to do, you know, snowmobiling, snow sledding. Um, and, and it was very memorable, right? It was, you know, taking, you know, going to school and friends showing up on snowmobiles, getting dropped off by their parents. Like it was, it was wild. Like, <clears throat> you know, literally, would get snowed in. We'd have blizzards sometimes and you're stuck in your house for two days. You know, it was, it was wild. That is crazy. Okay. So where was Tom Borelli, your dad, where was he before Lake Superior State? He was an assistant coach at Clemson in South Carolina. So was he there when they dropped? No, <clears throat> they dropped in, they dropped in like 94. Um, uh, let's see, Sammy Henson finished in 94 they must have dropped after the 95 season there was one more okay. year I think after Sammy and then they they discontinued the program I think after the 1995 season I might be off by a year or so but my dad was <clears throat> he was at Clemson prior to Lake Superior State so he was at Clemson call it uh I guess early to mid 80s uh, that time frame so you know he was he was a good 10 years at least shy of when they when they cut because I think he was well, I think he was, um, he must've been mid eighties there because he was at Lake Superior state from like 88 through 91. He started at CMU in 91. So your dad, I, hold on. <laughs> he left <laughs> South Carolina to go, <laughs> to go to links, to go to the UP. You were a Uper. Let's, let's be fair with this. <laughs> Jason Brelli was a Uper for five years. Yeah. Five years, five years. You were a Uper. Okay. From South Carolina, South Carolina to Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, which is an international town, right? Because there's Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Yeah. <laughs> and he's a South Carolina guy because he ran, you know, he's told me the track story about 
the South Carolina State track meet. Your dad is from South Carolina. He moved to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Did he ever visit before he took that job? Because that's insane. That's yeah. So you should ask him about this story because I've heard bits and pieces of it. Um, yes, he's he's from South Carolina. He was coaching at Clemson. So imagine, you know, you're at, you know, big time athletic department in the in the ACC, um, and he's going to the Upper Peninsula to go to a D2 school because he just wanted to coach. He wanted to, he wanted to lead his own program and and be in charge. You know, he'll tell that story, but I do remember hearing he drove, he had a little, like, um, I mean, it was a teeny little car. Um, I think it was a Honda. It was like a small little Honda. Um, and I have a few, I mean, I have, I have certainly have some memories of it, but he tells the story about when he was driving up there and he got closer and closer to the Mackinac bridge and it was nighttime. And, you know, they have the lights that, that light up the, um, the, uh, the bridge, like, um, the suspension uh, cables. The suspension cables. Yeah. And so as you're getting closer, all you see are these red lights just going straight up and he's thinking, is that the bridge? Like, there's no way my car is going to make it up that because it's so <laughs> steep. You know, of course, as you get closer, you realize that you're not driving up like that, but he, 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 you know, he says it was a wild experience going from South Carolina to, to there, but I think that some of the, he had a really, really enjoyable experience. You know, the athletic director at the time was Jim Fallis, and you probably know Jim. So Jim, um, he was an athlete, he was the former wrestling coach at Lake Superior State. And then when he stepped down, he took over as the athletic director. Um, so he had, my dad had a lot of support there, uh, with wrestling. And, um, of course, Jim went on to be the AD at, um, Northern Arizona and has worked, uh, you know, for the NWCA for the last, you know, decade or so, and done a lot of great things for the sport. But, um, he, my dad had a lot of support when he was there, but he does talk about just that, you know, how bizarre that is leaving from South Carolina at Clemson to go to Lake Superior state. That's drastic. Yeah. That's drastic. That's like lower 48, somewhere in the lower 48, moving to Alaska. It's like literally that drastic. I'm not even like exaggerating because it's crazy because South Carolina doesn't really have like any type of winter to speak of, right? They don't get snow ever, maybe once every 10 or 15 years. I mean, you were living up in the, I mean, dude, it is up there where you're at. Yeah. I went to a funeral in Ontario, in Sault Ste. Marie. In yep. February one year, and I was like, oh, my God, the snow was like, I thought Edinburgh was crazy. <laughs> Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario is crazy. If I had some pictures, I mean, I'm sure people that will listen to this have, have lived in the Upper Peninsula, but um, yeah, it was wild. I mean, we would get great snow and make snow forts, and we we had, a, I mean, my brother and I and all my friends, we had a lot of great memories from up there. So as a kid, you know, you just, it's it's what you know, you, you, awesome. you adjust, so. You get back that way often, or? Um, we've taken my, I have three young boys now. I have an eight-year-old and almost seven-year-old and then a three-year-old. Um, and we have taken the two older ones back up there to show them kind of where I grew up and they get a kick out of that. But, um, you know, not a lot. We just don't have really any reason to go up there anymore, but we, I get, you know, back to Michigan all the time because my family still lives there and my wife's from Michigan. So we get back to Michigan, but we don't really venture much North of Mount Pleasant. (laughs) So we stay in that area. We just did Higgins Lake uh, like two two summers ago, and Higgins Lake is highly underrated. Highly, All highly years. underrated. It is incredible. It was the like cl- blue Caribbean clear water. Yeah. It wasn't quite like Torch <clears throat> Lake, but it had spots like that. Yeah, it was amazing, man. And it was like it was during COVID, so we stole this place. The guy gave it to us because he just wanted the place run it out, and it was like just this. And it, we did it within a week because normally you got to book like a year in advance. Yeah. We did this like the week of, and it was just right on the fly. And it is just beautiful up there. Like what you're yeah. saying is like, Michigan is awesome. My wife's from Michigan too. So I, I yeah, I know all about it. We're normally that we've been Burt Lake. We've been mullet Lake. We've been, uh, yeah, been we haven't done Torch Lake yet. We've done Higgins. Lake. we did one about 45 minutes North of Mount Pleasant. I forget the name of that one. Was well, eight. so, so, um, if you make it to Higgins Lake, my wife's, all of my wife's family grew up and had, you know, a lot of them still live uh, on Higgins Lake. So I go to Higgins Lake a lot. Um, you know, that's my, my, my wife's from the Claire area, which is, um, you know, when you pass Mount Pleasant 20 minutes North, you hit Claire and then, you know, another 30 minutes past Claire, you hit Higgins Lake. So, um, uh, but you know, Metcalf's, you know, Brent Metcalf has his family lives on Higgins Lake. So there's a lot of people. up there. I didn't know that. That's crazy. That's awesome. It's a really cool area, but uh, 
Scotty Burnett and I, we take our families on these vacations and our wives were college roommates. So it's kind of a cool, cool thing, cool setup. But um, okay, let's talk travel because <laughs> you travel, your dad's traveled. You guys have made some unlikely moves, right? So let's just get into the Stanford thing a little bit, as much as you can get into it. Stanford, how close were you to knowing how, how much in the works was the American job before they saved wrestling at Stanford? Were you leaving regardless? Was, the, was it pretty clear to you that they weren't going to bring wrestling back? Uh, well, no, that last part, quite the opposite. I, I felt very confident that they that we would get it reinstated. Um, and especially in the weeks leading after the NSA tournament, uh, we caught a couple good breaks. We had a lot of momentum. Um, but once we got the ear of the president, um, that was my first indication that there was a real, real, real good chance we would get this overturned because the president at that point had no reason to be involved. And, and finally, you know, took a meeting from our, our alumni group and the 36 sports strong group that was helping back this. Um, and some of the prominent alumni from other sports, not the sports that were cut, but, you know, sports like basketball and football and, you know, a lot of the other, you know, big, big sports that, um, you know, were upset about it and, and wanted to kind of voice that frustration. But so as once the president got involved, you know, you sit back and you ask yourself why, right? Is he just wanting to hear for, you know, to do lip service and just do a part and, and hear, or is he genuinely looking to see if maybe there's a better way, which is what we kept saying all along. So I felt very confident from day one, but even more so post NCAA tournament that the program had a great chance to be reinstated. And in fact, my biggest, um, once I, once I decided and my wife and I and our family decided that, um, you know, it was probably in our best interest to, to move on. Um, my biggest concern was that my departure would be viewed as a, um, you know, there's no hope and that the, the program's done. And obviously, you know, Jason's Borelli's the head coach is leaving. So clearly there's no hope. And I did not want that to be a, ma a major distraction and de derail our efforts. And I didn't want to um, demotivate or bring the energy down from anyone that was fighting to keep all the programs and fighting for wrestling. So, um, you know, I made that decision and there were some things you know, some reasons why, right. Some personal reasons, um, you know, uh, everything from have a family and got to look out for my family. And, and of course I didn't know at the time I wasn't a hundred percent sure and had not been overturned. So, you know, you've got to make decisions, but I still felt like it was going to. Um, but I, once I got involved in the American, you know, process and exploring, I, I really fell in love with, you know, everything about it. I felt like, uh, Dr. Walker, Billy Walker, a great guy you know he supports wrestling the alumni at the school the location um you know uh, my wife's professional opportunities like everything just started making sense um and so one thing led to another and uh here we are but but i i felt really good about it the whole time and i think some of the people in the inner inner workings really did too but we really started feeling better post ncaa tournament but you know until you hear that decision until you know for sure you can feel great about something but you know, you don't control the outcome. So you still have to make decisions uh, based on what you have right in front of you. And all I had right in front of me was that the program wasn't reinstated yet. My job, my contract was ending in a few weeks, right? I was, my, my contract was ending on April 30th. And, you know, I ended up taking the job at American about two weeks before my contract was up, right? So um, there were a lot of things that played into it. You mentioned the people involved, right? You're in obviously unique situation, um, right. Was Ben Hada, right. Ohio guy. Was he involved? Robert Hada, Robert Hada, Robert. Okay. Um, but anyways, you, you had a unique situation. Um, you know, probably learned a million different things. Anything that stick out, you know, from a growth perspective from, from you, you know, now moving on to American, but like you learned, you know, different sides of, of how an institution works. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting because I go back and forth on this, Jared. I, I think it's obvious that the less of a financial constraint you are to a department, the better, right? Um, I think everyone coaches recognizes that if you can be, you know, self-sufficient and not cost the university a lot of money, you're less of a threat. But interestingly, at, at Stanford, we felt a little bit victim to, we weren't a high budget sport. We didn't cost a lot of money, but when they start making some of these decisions, what you learn is that 
there's sometimes more to it than just that as well, right? There's the, how do you piece all this together with gender equity and how do you, you know, and so sometimes you can fall victim to some, some things that are outside of your control, right? Like, you know, um, and so I, I would say, yeah, just learn kind of a little bit more of the inner workings of how decisions are made and what administrators might be thinking and how they're, you know, you know, what, when they're making decisions, um, I was open throughout the whole process and very candid with the administration and candid with everyone I spoke to that I felt like it was a decision that, uh, was very avoidable and could have been handled differently. And I never shied away from telling anybody that, including our administration. And I, you know, I just feel like, um, you know, communication is so important, right? When you, when you're running an organization or when you're, um, running a team or any business, you know, communication and, um, you know, putting everything out there and giving people opportunities and trying to always seek ways to get people included, like inclusive versus pushing people away. And, and, you know, I was pretty outspoken about that. I felt like, you know, we felt we kind of were getting pushed away at a time where I, I felt like everybody should be bringing everybody, everyone together. We were in the middle of a pandemic, something that we had never experienced before. Right. And, and we should have been looking for ways to come together. And, um, you know, I stand by that to this day. And I was very outspoken about that at the time. The biggest thing, you know, like I think about is you and Ray Blake and Coach Terrapelli, the position you guys were put in. Coach Terrapelli's from the area, right? He's not from, from what, two hours away? Bakersfield, three hours away? How far is Bakersfield? Uh, he's, Five hours away? He's from Fresno. So he's, Fresno, I meant, sorry. Um, little less, little less than three, two, 245 or so. so. He's not, you know what I mean? Like he's, he's not in this like crazy situation. He's got his family's all back there. His brother's coach there. His dad's around there. He's from, you know what I mean? Like, so that guy's not in that bad of a situation. Ray Blake left as a high schooler, you know, the Chicagoland area and never looked back, you know, and his wife is from Oklahoma. So how committed were you guys? Cause these opportunities came up and you can only, like you're saying, you got to look out for your family. Right. And now first off, how far is DC from Mount Pleasant? Uh, a lot closer than California was. Exactly. Yeah. Cause, cause getting, putting your three boys in a car, yeah. or a van right and driving it's two and a half three days and it's a nightmare it's a yeah. total nightmare right like now you can put them in the car and you can be up to your mom and dad's house in eight 12 hours oh yeah definitely i i we've already driven it i've driven it twice and i've driven it with my family once um it takes to get to mount pleasant about eight hours um you know it, it probably with kids it's about nine because you got stops and everything but i when i drove it back by myself um when I came back this summer, it took about eight hours to get, get from Mount Pleasant to my house in, in Mar I, we live in Rockville, Maryland. We're about half hour north of DC. So, so, okay. So yeah, you're, you're even closer in Rockville, yep. right? Yep. That's crazy. Okay. So you and Ray, Ray gets a head coaching opportunity. You get a head coaching opportunity. His is at a high school. Is it Bixby? Bixby. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys get these opportunities. How long were you like, how, well, how quick was the timeline on you guys taking those jobs compared to the, the, the team getting saved? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Well, you know, Ray, Ray stayed longer because once I left in late April, um, you know, we had, we had really fought hard actually to make sure our student athletes were going to be treated as student athletes through the entire academic year. And so, um, you know, we we felt like they owed, um, and well, not only did they owe them that they, they kind of said that, that they would, they were, we were, they, they, when they first came out with the announcement, the way they worded it was that following the 2021, um, or let's see, 2021, am I, am I in the right years, wh whatever that academic year was through the academic year. And so when they used that word wording, I thought, okay, well, they're not discontinuing this right after, right in March, you know, these guys need to be treated like student athletes up until May when, you know, or whenever they are in school through, you know, through June. And so we worked really hard for that. But, and I, and I said, you know, these guys, some of them might want to train freestyle. Some of them might have you know, other things to do. They've got to figure out kind of what the next steps are for them. So once we got that blessing. Um, we knew the athletes had a little more time, uh, but I had to make a decision sooner. So I made a decision in late April, but the guys needed coaches, right? So they needed um, someone to be around them. If we're going to have student athletes on campus that are wrestling, they needed to have coaches. So they worked it out to where Ray and Alex would stay uh, in limited capacity and be the coaches moving forward. But once I left 
in May on May 18th is the day they reinstated the program, right? So May 18th, and then at but that point it was kind of they needed to find a head coach now, right? So once they made that decision, and Ray actually, um, you know, applied and interviewed for the job. You know, so he was a, he was a finalist for the job, and they obviously went with Rob Cole. And then as soon as that happened, obviously Ray was on to next steps for him. So he ended up. Uh, his wife is from Oklahoma. She's from, <clears throat> uh, she's a lawyer. She does, uh, she's Native, Amer Native American and does um, law. Uh, she does legal work, land, land law and a lot of stuff like that for uh, on the Native American side. And so going back to Oklahoma <clears throat> was actually uh, great for her because she's from there and she could get closer to home and they could, um, you know, they could get back near family. And so it worked out and there was a position at Bixby and um, one thing led to another, you know, you could talk to Ray about all that, but he ended up at Bixby high school and it's, been great i think they're doing awesome so do they make him better than ray blake no he's an awesome guy man really awesome guy yeah oh, yeah so ray, ray, Stanford. ray's ray's one of the he's he's a rock star he's he's actually um him and alex both and i don't just say that because i've coached with them for the longest time but those two guys are as as good as they come at what they do right they are so passionate about the sport and they're so you know just they're high character guys that work really hard and they don't have a lot of vices in life. You know, they care deeply about their family, care deeply about their job and they treat it, you know, they take it very serious, you know, and, and um, you know, they don't need it. They don't do it for the glitz and glamor and the, you know, the, the uh, yeah, I guess like the accolades or anything like that that comes along with it. They do it for the right reason. And so those guys um, really have been kind of the cogs in the wheel that have, kept everything going for a long time. Uh, you know, the whole time I was at Stanford, you know, they were behind the scenes. So. Go ahead. Zach. Okay, so, so moving forward now we're in DC, right? You're in Rockville, you know, uh, how early did you move out? Did the whole family, cause that's not like one of these things where you can make these trips back and forth. It is literally coast to coast. Yeah. Right. There, there's not really room for, well, I'm going to go check an apartment out or a, a condo or a house out this week. I'll be back. Did you all move together? Um, and you got young kids. I mean, this is a huge uproot and upheaval, a coast to coast move. Did you all do it together? Did you drive it together? Did you have, uh, did you have a, uh, a moving semi truck? How did the, the move go for you? Did you all do it together? Yeah. Um, no, it was, a, that was a little bit of chaos. So, uh, let's see, I started late April, but needed to get out here and be around for some things. So I was coming out every weekend. I would fly out, did that for like four weekends. And in, in the process, so that was most of May, I was coming out and looking at houses on the weekends and trying to find where we were going to live. Um, my wife and I, from day one, kind of decided we wanted to buy a home um, because we wanted to root ourselves here. You know, we, we kind of thought there were two things we wanted to avoid. We really wanted to avoid a double move, right? So moving our kids starting them in a school, you know, maybe renting somewhere. And then after a year moving again, once we decided to buy a house, right. Cause that's what everyone suggested. Oh, why don't you go learn the area, you know, rent for a while and then figure out where you want to live. And I just, that didn't sound exciting to me that the move twice in a, in, you know, a year's time. So, um, I would come out, do some work, be here, stay, and look at houses and we put like a lot, like, I don't know, less than 10, but maybe like six or so offers in and we just couldn't get anything. The market was nuts around here. And um, finally we did. And um, let's see, I think we moved out, out here early June. I, you know, I had been coming back and forth. We closed on our house quickly. I think I wanna say early June or somewhere thereabouts. And um, we moved out. My my wife flew out with the kids. I packed the car up and drove the remaining scraps out that we couldn't fit. And what we had done is because when I first took the job in April, I actually had to be, we had to be out of our house. I, I, gosh, this is a lot, but I lived on campus at Stanford and part of my previous job, um, housing was part of my contract. The so coaching would, pavilion, right? Yeah. I remember the coaching pavilion. You were kind of waiting to get into the coaching pavilion yep. because you couldn't afford a house in that area because it was so sky high. Yep. So in 2001, I moved on camp or 2011, sorry, 2011, I moved on campus and had been living um, in a really awesome like neighborhood on campus that they had built for coaches. But 
once I took the new job, I had, you know, X amount of days to be out of that house. And so we didn't have a house. We didn't have anywhere to go out East and I was losing housing. So we, we thought, what are we going to do? We can't go with the traditional moving company because we have nowhere to take our stuff and we don't know if we're going to have house. So we bought pot or we rented the pods, right? They package the pods up and you can have those for up to 30 days or whatever it is. And, you know, then once you know where that you want them delivered, they deliver them. So we had the pods, but we couldn't fit everything in the pods. Um, there was a shortage on pods. Because, those pods, pods up quick, right? Yeah. And we couldn't get another one. So we were scrambling, selling stuff, getting rid of it and packaging the car to the tightest we could. And I had a dog still that I had to bring out and we didn't want to fly them. So wife and kids flew across. And then I took three or four days and drove across country with the remaining scraps of our stuff and my dog. And one of my, one of my best friends volunteered to go with me so that I didn't have to go alone. So it was me my buddy and my dog. And, you know, we ventured across the country. Nice. Oh my God, dude. How long, four days? Yeah, it wasn't too, we rushed it. You know, I, looking back, like, yeah, you know, I wish I would have taken more time and enjoyed more, but one, I had a, I have an 11 year old dog with me who doesn't do great on trips, but two, I was exhausted. I had been back and forth so many times. This was the last thing, like the last part of the move. So I was just like, get, get me to my new house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, so you uh, had a house to go to though. You were like new on address you were going to, you yeah. weren't going to an extended stay hotel. You weren't going to Mount Pleasant. You were right. going right to Rockville, Maryland. Yeah. We had finally settled or closed on our house. And, you know, I think I want to say I got here. If I have my days right seemed like it was like June 9th or something, June 8th or June 9th or something like that. Oh my God, dude. What a whirlwind. Jesus. I mean, crazy madness. So you're there, right? And I started watching your, your tour videos. You're a very good tour guide, by the way. I start, you know, cause I, I try and, you know, devour as much of the social media from everybody that I can, the mid major ones. And you you know, the other ones you can't avoid when the, other big time stuff because it's so saturating you guys do a really good job because you know smaller mid-major schools have to but like what's the biggest thing that sold you on american university and and knowing you're going to make this coast to coast move you're now going to be closer to your your roots in mount pleasant michigan but what sold you on on uh american university in washington dc well i'm not sure that it was one particular thing um I think it was a combination of about three or four things that all really, they check big boxes for me. One was our administrative support. You know, I, like I said, Dr. Walker, you know, he's, I've known him for quite a while. He's been on the NCA committee for, you know, I think multiple times, actually, he's, he's probably served on at least two stints. Um, he's a former wrestler himself, coached at an air force and just a great guy. And, um, someone that I really, really enjoy, you know, being around and I, and he's a genuine guy and I think he's a great leader and I, you know, you want to work for a guy like that. So that was a big part of it. The people that I met around, um, the department around the campus, but also our alumni, I got a chance to, to connect with quite a few alumni during the interview process. And all of them are so passionate about AU. And so not only so passionate, but wanted to help. And I learned, you know, Jared, you asked me this earlier about maybe things I had learned at Stanford. I didn't know how the importance of this maybe until it actually happened. But once you get into the trenches and you get into the fight, it's so important to have supportive alumni and people that support you and back you and are engaged in the program because honestly, like strength, your strength in numbers, right? You know, so, you know, we had to, we raised, you know, 13 or so million dollars and, you know, it wasn't through the strength of five people. It was through the strength of hundreds of people. Right. And so, um, when I was interviewing at American, the support and the engagedness of like the alumni was really startling in a good way to me, you know, it was like, wow. So there was that, the administrative support, um, the athletes, when I got a chance to talk to them, really enjoyed getting to know them. And what I realized is that, you know, here's a private school in Washington, DC, um, with networks, you know, that are really deep in terms of business opportunities, professional opportunities, um, and the location relative to great high school wrestling. There was a lot of, a lot of things. So, you know, just started checking a lot of boxes. And of course the, one of the bigger boxes, you know, Zeb is that uh, my wife isn't, she's a social worker, a therapist, right? So her, her, her professional career, you know, in a, a setting like DC or their surrounding suburbs is, 
uh, is stronger than any rural parts of the country. So, um, and I also wanted to raise three boys in an area where there was, you know, they were going to get to be experience culture, diversity, and, and things like that, really important to me and my wife. And so, you know, I just started checking a lot of boxes. You know, if you want to work in the federal government and you want to have anything to do with the federal government and, you know, it's our largest employer in the United States of America, uh, a pretty good start is an American university. I found that out when I visited when Tig was the head coach. Uh, I did a thing with Martin Floriani flew out. We flew out and did a thing with Jim Jordan. And, uh, uh, you know, on the visit, I was able to go over and hit Teague up and check the place out. Um, we saw Coach Centrowitz doing stuff on the track. And I, what I really liked, it was a pretty compact campus right there. It was beautiful. And everybody was outside. It was a nice spring day. It was really cool place. But the biggest thing that I, that I learned about DC was obviously the proximity to anything in Washington, DC. It, it, it is right there. I, I think it was three, three stops at the most four stops at the most for me to go from Congress where Jordan's offices were to if memory serves me to go to American it's right there yeah. it's it's not far and you don't have yeah. to have a car or anything that was really cool too yeah it is and it's it's an awesome setting because it's close enough to DC where you can be down to that stuff quickly but it's far enough out to where when you're on campus and you're near campus you don't feel like you're in the hustle and bustle of DC you know it's very quaint we sit in you know a neighborhood essentially we're surrounded by these you know five plus million dollar homes all around the, the campus. And so, you know, you, there's a, there's a feeling of safe, safeness and um, just community that you get. And then you drive five miles in one direction and you're downtown DC. Right. And so you, you kind of are separated by um, neighborhood and housing and trees and landscaping. And then you don't, you're not in that uh, hustle and bustle, which I really, really like because, you know, when you think of DC, sometimes you think of madness and a lot going on. Right. And, um, you know, when you come to our campus, you, you're kind of like, wow, I can't believe I'm in this close to downtown DC yet. I feel so like pulled away. Right. So it's neat. That's a great description that you just gave it because that, that was the kind of the vibe I got definitely. Cause I remember what, am I wrong on the amount of stops? Is it five or 10 stops? How many stops is it from, from where I was in like the where congress is and all that were we that far away or how was it closer i mean i can't remember no, you're, i don't know if that's there i have not i have not uh been here long enough and done that where i would know exactly how many stops but uh, it's not far so i could imagine it's you might be right for yeah because sure. it was like because i was talking and he's i popped up i walked out of the subway and like take more's waiting there and we get in the truck and boom we're on the campus i was like oh my god this is such close proximity do you have to drive in every day Jason from, from Rockville or can you take a train? Yeah, I can do either. I, I have been driving. Um, just, I don't know. It's something, it's not that I don't want to take the train and I won't, but I just, uh, something about just having the ability to just go at your own leisure, right? You're not, you, know, you just have a car, you can stay late and don't have to worry about missing a train or being on a time schedule. For me, sometimes I'm in at six in the morning and don't leave until eight o'clock at night, right? You just, you know, it's such sporadic hours that I feel like the car is better suited for me right now. Yeah, no doubt. I, I'm looking at the staff right now. How did you, how did you convince Alex to do the same cross country move that you did? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know, we, him and I have just worked together for a while and share a lot of the same beliefs. And so I think you know, he wanted to stay in coaching. Once he made that decision that he wanted to stay in coaching, um, I tried to create a position and an opportunity for him that would be hard to say no to. And knowing that we have a great relationship and, um, and I, and he was the number one person I wanted from day one, him and Ray. And I knew I wasn't getting Ray and, um, and just worked really hard to get Alex and it worked out, you know, so, uh, there wasn't a lot of convincing. I think him and I mesh well together. Right. Um, again, we, We've had, we served, you know, he was on my staff twice at Stanford, right? He was on it on the front end and then on the back end after, after things didn't work out at Penn. And we just, you know, we've been together a long time and know each other well. So, you know, it was, seemed fitting if we could work it out financially and work it out, you know, professionally for him, you know, making him an associate head coach because he does want to be a head coach again someday. So, you know, just wanted to iron some of those little things out and we, we were able to work it out. So I'm, I'm grateful. 
and you brought Joey Dance in from Davidson. Yeah. And then Ganbayar Sanja. Ganbayar is Mongolian, right? Yeah, he's awesome. Is he been? He did he ever leave the states after he wrestled at uh, American? Mm, I think he's been living here the whole time. Yeah, um, okay. He did go back and wrestle in their nationals, uh, you know, for freestyle at least on one, if not multiple occasions. But never the, moved back. Never moved back. No. Because he been he, in the DC area the whole time. No, I think he, I think he initially, I'd have to go back and check now that you asked that, but I think when, Co when Mark Cody left for Oklahoma, I think he went out to Oklahoma and trained out there for a while. Got it. Yeah. Okay. I think I vaguely remember that. Yeah. And then I think he, and then I think he ended up, I actually think he ended up at Maryland with Kerry McCoy for a while too. So, and then, um, but I, I, I seem to remember that he might've gone with Cody for a bit out to Oklahoma. Yeah, that sounds right. So when you're putting a staff together and you kind of like, you're at this new place, you're 3000 miles away from where you just were, you know, luckily they're able to save their program. You get into American. What are the first things that come to mind? Here's what I have to do to make my mark. This is what we have to do to be successful. What had to be changed? What did you have to do the same? What did you need to hit the ground running at, in DC to make a winning program? Well, I think, uh, I mean, putting together staff is, is one of your first objectives. But you can be doing some things at the same time and putting together a staff uh, took a while because, you know, you just want to make sure you get it right. You don't want to rush into just hiring anybody. Um, I was pretty particular with what I was looking for. And I'm so grateful that it worked out with Alex and Joey and Gombayar. I mean, those were guys that I locked in on pretty quickly and were able to make it work. And, um, you know, and that comes back from having support, administrative support and alumni support. You know, that's how you make things like that happen. Uh, but but while that's going on, um, I, I felt like had a huge it needed it needed to really connect with the team and make sure they knew that um, I was there for them. Right. Like so for me, a new coach comes in and it's all, all too often the, the focus becomes on that new coach getting his guys in there, his recruits. Right. And yes, I want to recruit and we're recruiting now, but I wanted to make sure that our guys realize we're here for them too, right? We're not overlooking them. And, um, you know, we want them to reach their goals. They were there for a reason. Previous staff believed in them. They're, you know, obviously successful wrestlers and we have no reason to not believe in them either. And we just want to get to work and help them. And so I would say from day one, my focus was just to pour myself into the guys on the roster be there for them, work all summer with them, build relationships with them and make them understand that they have a fair chance and that, that we're not trying to over recruit them, you know, and, and that stuff. So I've really enjoyed our team. We have, we have some great guys and they work as hard as anyone I've ever been around. They have positive attitudes, like the next, every, you know, the next best great group of guys, you know, they just, they're awesome. And um, everything has been has been really great on that end. So I would say to answer your question, staff and gaining trust in your, in the athletes on the team. And now kind of the phase after that is now we're, we're starting to recruit, right? We're starting to find the next group that will come in and continue, you know, kind of moving us forward with, with the same core that we have on the team right now. Right. You mentioned, you know, in the, in the heat of the season right now, but uh, you got a young team, right? Really yeah. good team, right? We had 60 guys wrestled against Sacred Heart in Virginia or something like that. Yeah, we only have a roster of 25. We got, oh, wow. I think the write up might have said 16, but I actually think we had 17 guys get matches um, in the two duels. And in the first duel, seven of them, <clears throat> seven of the 10 were wrestling in their first college match. You know, so they were either true freshmen or were sophomores that didn't get a season last year. So they were wrestling in their, their very first college match. So, um, nine guys total that wrestled in our first two duels between both duels were wrestling in their first college matches. So we do have a very, very young team and we're actually not going to redshirt anybody. So we, um, we're going to let everyone battle this year, you know, and just let everyone battle it out and, and see where it shakes out and give everyone a chance. And I think that will really help us, um, not only with depth this year, but, um, it'll help us moving into the future because all those guys will have got a, you know, a full season of college wrestling to learn from. That's an elite academic institution where you are, right? Mm -hmm. But where you came from is considered to be the standard for where student athletes go. 
I think they've has Stanford ever lost what used to be the Sears Cup and the Directors Cup. Have they ever not won it. So it's interesting you brought that up. The very first one that when they started this, uh, started that, you know, 30 years ago or 20, whatever many years ago it has been. I've lost count because I haven't been telling that stat in a while when I, when I used to recruit on it. But, um, you know, the very first one, North Carolina won, and then Stanford won like 20 some director's cups in a row for the top athletic department. But until last year, last year was the first year that they didn't win it. And, and since the first one, so the streak was broken this wow. past, past year. Yeah. Wow. And now you're recruiting against them. So we got to, we got to throw that out there. They didn't win it last year. We want everybody okay. to know Stanford did not win the director's cup last year. It, it must be put out there. They're <laughs> the enemy now. <laughs> it's gotta be weird. You know, that's a weird turnaround because now coach Cole has your team. You, you inherited a lot of guys that take more, you know, yeah. he, he recruited. So it's like, it was like this weird shift. Right. And now you're like seeing the guys. And I know you look at stuff and you see results and you're like, Oh man, I recruited that guy. I was sitting in the, I was sitting in the front front room with his parents when he signed. And yeah. that's gotta be a weird thing, you know, cause that was you know, like you're saying, that's a big focus where a lot of guys feel like, Oh, they got to get us out of here and get their recruits in here. Right. The hundred percent, the hardest part about this whole thing, the hardest thing people ask me, man, it must've been a hard transition. And I say, listen, that's, you know, life happens, you know, things happen and you, you, you do your best. And, you know, we went into that endeavor when on day one, on minute one, on second one, when we heard they were discontinuing the program, we were like, well, we're going to get it reinstated and, you know, we're going to fight to the very end and we're going to do everything we possibly can and never wavered from that belief. And, um, you know, and so like, you know, people are, oh, you, you know, they want to feel sorry for you, but it's kind of like, you know, it, it, it happened. It's terrible and it, no one wanted to go through it. And I don't wish it on anybody, but, you know, you make the most of a situation. But I would say looking at the situation, what was the hardest for me isn't, isn't that the hardest part was leaving the guys and those alumni. I have so much respect for our alumni, Robert Hada, Patricia Miranda, Sean Harmon, you know, the people behind the scenes that were just grinding with us to, to, to get this right and to get it turned around. They're amazing people. And it brought a group of people so close together. It's really hard to explain, you know, the student athletes and the coaches were really close because what we were going through for the year, like fighting in the pandemic and outdoor practices and all that stuff, you know, we became connected <clears throat> on a deeper level for that reason, but the staff and the alumni became so close and, um, it was really remarkable to watch that happen, that how, how, how connected that support and that, that keep Stanford wrestling group now is still going strong. And, and I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Like the, the momentum and the, and the power and the train they have going now because of, of that and, and what's going to happen in the future and where that program is going to go is really, it's really hard for me to wrap my head around. Um, but I feel great about it because ultimately that's what we wanted, right? We wanted the program to be in a better spot and to come back and be re revitalized and, and take off to a whole new level. And I'm happy that that's, that's going to happen, but you know, not being in the <clears throat> around guys like Shane and real and Jaden Abbas and uh, Jackson Desario and Tyler Ishans and, you know, on and on Nick Stim at Jason Rand. I mean, I could go forever. Logan Ashton, those guys, they're awesome. They're awesome. And that was really, really, really hard. And, and I, I lost more sleep over that and shed more tears over, you know, having to, to leave those guys than I did anything else. So talk, wow. talk about wrapping your brain around anything, right? Fighting the whole COVID, all the restrictions and outdoor practice and what testing multiple, you know, seven to 10 times, however many times a week. And then, you know, you talk about Shane, you know, <laughs> That, that, that's just that that I can't wrap my brain around that. You're fighting to save a program, fighting the whole all the COVID stipulations and that. That that just had to be that, that had to be amazing. It was it it was um, March twentieth was, I mean, it, it was one of the greatest days um, because it meant it was not just about Shane winning. It was what it what his win represented and who it impacted. Right, the the impact that it had. Um, it was, it was, it was a great day. Um, and I think everyone felt that way. I, when he won, so many people felt like they won too. Right. And it was a unique thing. And I'm not even talking about wrestling and Stanford alumni and Stanford people. I think wrestling people around the country just felt like 
we won, you know, when, when he's on the big stage and everyone's chanting, keep Stanford wrestling. And, you know, it was just a cool moment. And, um, and it was a culmination of so many things that people didn't see. And you mentioned some of these, you know, having to move outdoor practices, having, you know, nearly get our season canceled and then having to go on, you know, a road trip for 15 days. And that was all we were going to get. It was like, you have to get it in in 15 days. And if you don't, you're done. And so then having to move a different location for outdoor practices. And we were testing eight to nine times a week because, um, you know, we had to antigen test every day that we had contact. So five days a week when we were practicing, we had to antigen test, but then we had to PCR test three days a week. So we were testing up to eight, almost nine times a week, sometimes for, from November through March. And then what people don't know, there was little things, which are crazy. Um, you know, we got shut down uh, because we had some guys test positive during the holiday break. And our guys were living on campus in a, in a dorm all by themselves. So it was almost like prison for these guys. They couldn't leave the dorm. They weren't supposed to leave. They couldn't have people over. They had to stay in six person pods in the dorms. It was, it was wild. And then at practice, they could only practice with their pod of six. So if you were Shane, you only had five guys that you could train with the whole year. And it was just by virtue of who they put in your, you know, your dorm suite. So like, now we tried to do it by weight class to be smart, but there was just so many things. Then we get to the NCAA tournament and at the NCAA tournament, the NCA had us testing each morning, but Stanford made us go to a hospital and PCR test multiple times when we were there. So we were in between sessions, shuffling guys to a hospital to get additional testing. And what, why that became problematic and, and really worrisome for people is because remember a PCR test, if you test positive, you can't test out of, you're done. You're absolutely done. There's no, there's, and, and there's false positives. And the worry is always, you send a guy to the hospital, he tests it, tests, it's a false positive, but you know, or, or it's positive. It doesn't matter. It's, you're done. You're absolutely done. And so when, when most of the, when all of the NCAA participants got through their last test, they thought they were golden for the rest of the tournament. And they were, we still had to test on Thursday and Friday. So we were going to the hospital and still testing. And so I don't say that to bring like pity on our, on our, you know, or have people, but it was just like, there were just so many things that were happening. People um, didn't and, realize that you had to go on yeah. the big, that, that is amazing. Yeah. That is amazing that you accomplished what you accomplished that you guys got real to the tournament. Mm -hmm. I can't even believe you got into the, I don't even know how you did that. Was it that was like, a wild story? <laughs> what was that? And then everybody was like pulling against you. And I'm like, what are you doing? Why won't, why don't you want one of the best guys in the tournament? And I know everybody wants to have all Americans and everybody wants to win, but I'm like, I want this guy in the tournament so bad. I was like, that thing made me so mad. And it was such a, the black, the black, when you guys wore the black, oh man, you went full Johnny cash. <laughs> that to me was such a, just like stick it to the man. And then I remember it was either your AD who didn't even tweet about it. He tweeted about something else and man, people jumped all over him about that. It was just all the stuff. It was just like, man, do they, how do they realize what they've put these guys through and what they accomplished? I just don't think people got it. I don't think people got it. And the, and, the wrestling community got it. Yeah. Well, I think, the, yeah. But when you explain this extra layer, it's almost like they wanted you to fail. It was just so bizarre. It was a, it was a wild few months, but you know what? Ultimately, it worked out, right? And, you know, maybe, you know, kind of, um, I said this, like, from day one, the goal was save the program. And we did that. And if that came at the expense of me or anyone else, you know, our staff, like, if you would have told me that from day one, I would have gladly stepped aside if it meant saving the program. So the fact that um, the program's there and I'm not right. We got what we, that, that would have been, I would have chose that from day one. You know, if, if on July, um, you know, the day that this announcement came out, you know, uh, July 8th, um, if they would have said, Borelli, if you're not here, the program's back, of course, I'm going to choose that. So the fact that I'm not there and the program's back, that's what I would have wanted from day one anyway. So it doesn't really matter. Right. Like, so, um, you know, it's a win for everybody. And I'm so grateful that uh, it worked out the way it did at the end. Um, no one, I wouldn't wish anyone to go through that, but I'm glad that it ended the way it ended. And I'm happy that uh, all of our alumni, you know, can continue to cheer for their alma mater. And I'm happy that all the guys are going to get to graduate and get a Stanford degree. Right. So it's a win-win. Well, yeah. So 
you know, all the hard work, right? So <laughs> program, where were you at? You know, what was that like when you heard the news? Like, obviously, you know, it was, you had to work in it, but you kind of moved on. Right. But what was that like? Yeah. So, um, we, we found out a couple of days before the announcement. Um, and I was real, it was, it was almost impossible to not like, right. Right. Not know. So, so, um, but I kind of let, I just, I'd sent to a lot of pe- people that I was close to people in the coaching world that I respect immensely. You know, I'd kind of said, Hey, you know, it's going to be a great day for wrestling tomorrow. And, um, <clears throat> you know, they were like, Hey, is, is that, what's that mean? Yeah. You know, all this stuff. And I was like, just, it's going to be a great day for wrestling. And, um, and I think everyone started figuring it out. And then I was on a plane the next day. So I was on the day the announcement came out that official announcement came out, right. So the, the night before we're, you know, we know it's coming out, but like, I, I'm like, I can't believe it until you see it right. Until, you know, um, and I was on a plane out here and actually funny story. I don't know if Dr. Walker, if Billy wants me sharing this, but I, the announcement came out and I landed and my phone had blown up. And one of the calls was a bunch of our, our alumni from AU and, and our AD and administrators. And they were all a little bit in panic because they thought that maybe that meant that like I was going to be going back or something like that. You know, people, they did, it was just like, a lot of people had questions and I was like, whoa, 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 like, like we're good. And it was just, it was interesting, but it was so many people are so happy uh, about it. And I, I, it was kind of cool because I, I didn't know when the release was coming out, but I know that when I landed and touched down in DC, I turned my phone back on and it was just like, and I was like, Oh, the announcement came out. And then I didn't even like read any of the, the tweets or anything right away. I just was trying to find the article to make sure that it was real. hundred <laughs> percent. Right. Official. Oh man. Yeah. That's that so wild. Awesome. So what, okay. So you and your dad, you, you obviously have a good relationship with your dad. I asked him last year, I was like, Hey, what would you think about, Jason Borelli coming on staff at Central Michigan. And he gave me the Tom Borelli answer to that. Oh, we'd love to have Jason Borelli on the staff. And he gave me, you know, he gave me a good answer. But like, how long is that guy? How much like I ask him, I'm like, how much longer are you gonna do this? And ultimately, I mean, I could see you back in Central in, in Mount Pleasant, but you know, I know you're worried about getting American Eagles to where you got Stanford to, right? But that's obviously your goal right now. But is that a dream job eventually? Where do you go with that? I get asked that question a lot and it's pretty easy to answer because that's not an option right now. So, so I don't even have to entertain it. Um, you know, I think when I took the Stanford job, I remember at our first banquet, you know, my message was, this is the only job I care about. It's the only job I want. I want to be here for 30 years. And I, I look forward to standing up here at the podium in 30 years and, um, you know, feeling the same way about Stanford as I did you know, I do now. And and that's true at AU, right? I love everything about it. I'm really excited. And I don't have any intentions of not being here. And it's part of the reason we bought a house here. I wanted to, to, to root myself in DC and make this home. So right now that's the focus. And I can't even think past any of that. I will say that I am certainly not oblivious. And I know that one day my dad will retire. And I think naturally, I'll probably ask, be asked about that job and I'll have to entertain it at that point. But right now I can't even really wrap my head around that because it's not even a thought. It's not even a thought, right? It's, it's a place that brings great memories to me. It's my alma mater. It's where I grew up, you know, and, um, and I have just a lot of great feelings for that town, but, um, you know, I also love AU and this is my job and, um, I couldn't imagine myself anywhere else right now. So. Your dad is still really elite. Your dad is like, I, cause, you know, I watched the, I did their duel with uh, Cleveland state last year and how he teaches the guys, how he communicates with the guys. He's not like this loud, crazy person, even remotely. He's super low key and he has a plan. Everybody's got to stick to the plan and he's got guys. If you're not, you know, you got to do it his way. Right. And you can tell, with the buy-in. He always gets buy-in, man. Everybody buys into what Tom Borelli does. I He's like a Jedi to me, man. He is incredible. And then to talk to him and see how he talks to his guys and how he communicates, he's still got it, man. And that's yeah. the thing. Like when he says that to me, he's like, well, you know, I think that I, you know, I'm still effective at this. I still enjoy doing this. I still think I'm helping kids. I'm like, well, yeah, no, you, you're good. You're really good. Your guys are really good. So he's still like highly effective. What is he? 60. How old is Tom Borelli? 
born in 56 so he's 65 See, he is he is at a high level man he's still one of the best coaches in the country that's amazing and that's got to drive you you right yeah you know he um you know what makes him so effective is people ask me this a lot and there's a couple of things but like one of them i think is um kind of goes back to what i was telling you guys like one of the top things that i was trying to focus on when i got the job is pouring yourselves into the athletes so that they know how much you care about them and, and how much you're there for them yes you want to win um, but it, we don't do this, you know, we do it. We definitely train to win. We want to win and, and we feel a responsibility to win, but for the individual athlete, if you just are getting out of when, if you're only getting out of your college experience, wins and losses, you know, I think as coaches, we failed, we failed the kids, right? If it's just the focus is just winning and losing, there's more to it. And as coaching and collegiate coaching is, is about mentoring and developing young men and leaders and character and all that stuff. So and I think my dad does a great job of, um, you know, making people in the program understand that, that, uh, you know, the goal is to win, we're going to train to win, and we're not going to lower the standard. In fact, we're going to raise the standard. But if you don't win, you're going to win in other ways, right? You're going to, you're going to become a great man, a great leader, you're going to develop a work ethic and, you know, character that's going to carry you forever. And so, but the way he accomplishes that is by not changing the standard you know, elevating the standard, if anything, raising the bar, but just pouring himself into his athletes. He, it's, it's really remarkable. Like to think, I mean, the guy still mops mats, like before practice, the guy cleans the wrestling room all day. It has a little vacuum cleaner out and it's going around and vacuuming the corners of the wrestling room. He's in there. You know, if, if guys are doing individual drills, one thing that was amazing about my dad, and I, I have a hard time with this because you just get wore out is my dad would be at every individual drill. Like if you're doing an individual drill, even if he's not leading it, he's going to go in the wrestling room and just sit and watch just to see what you're working on so that you as an athlete know, well, maybe he wasn't helping me or coaching me, but he cares enough to come watch and see what I'm trying to learn or what I'm learning. And like, he's just at everything. And, and um, that's a big credit to my mom that she lets him do that um, because he's just, he's never home. Like the guy, the guy leaves, and is like, he's just wrestling. He is so wrestling and, care, and well, let me put it this way. It's not just wrestling. He, he has, he's, he, he's got a lot, he's, he's deep. He's going to have a lot of stuff and he's very in tune with the world, but, but he cares so much about his athletes. No one doubts that in the program. And when the, when the athletes feel like you care, that's when you can be a good coach, right? Because they don't even care how much, you know, they don't care if you know wrestling. They just want to make sure you care about them. And once they know you care about them, you could teach them the worst single leg in their world, but they're going to believe it works because they believe in you. Right. And so I've, I've always felt like that's the one thing my dad gets out of things is, is nobody doubts how much he cares about them when he coaches them. The, the hardest phone call I've ever heard him make was, was telling him no to central Michigan. It was not, I don't know, Zeb, if you knew that and I was between central and Kent and I, I remember exactly where I was and I had to call and tell him no, because he reminds me a lot of my dad, um, you know, just true, authentic, genuine person. And it was, it was a hard call. You know, it's like to tell him, no, it's, it was a hard choice and, and what an awesome guy, you know, but um, I guess the question I have for you is, you know, obviously you've learned a lot from him. How, how are you different from him? Um, well, I was, I was forced to be a little bit different, I think, because I was at Stanford and that um, I couldn't recruit a, a student athlete, um, maybe in as, as a controlled, like a, as a, um, you know, he can be pretty selective on who he recruits and the kid he recruits to CMU and the, the, you know, the work ethic and the, where the kid comes from, you know, when I was recruiting at Stanford because of the high academic standards, you kind of had to take, you know, in some regards, you took what you could get and you had to try to, to teach to a lot of different styles, right. And you had to design a program that catered toward a lot of uniqueness, a lot of different individual needs. And I think probably my dad doesn't have to do that as much. And so for me, um, I feel like I've learned to coach um, quite a vast array of like different personalities and different um, skill sets. Um, but that's because I just had to, right? And I had to at a, at a young age with what we were getting. It's just a different type, different beast. The recruiting was a little different. You couldn't be as focused, as narrow focused as maybe he could be. So maybe there's some differences there. <laughs> um, I think I'm a little edgier than him. 
Uh, I think he's really laid back and I don't, I, I definitely think I'm pretty collected like comparatively to, to a lot of coaches. Um, but um, I still have that spunky youthfulness. Right. And I still, uh, I can, I can get into it a little bit. And um, my dad doesn't get rattled much. Like my dad just, he's pretty even keeled and I can get worked up a lot different. So you've had a lot to get yeah. worked up about, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he is super, like when I watch the matches, he never loses his mind. Guy, you know, I, I got pinned last year, I think, in the duel with Cleveland State, maybe. That might have happened. Or a guy lost a match on a throw or something, and he didn't lose his mind. He didn't scream at the kid. He didn't go nuts. And he's just, like you say, he's just like, he he's cerebral is what I like to call him. You know what I mean? He'll sit there and take notes. How about that? Yeah, he's, got, notes. he's, got, he's got an incredible um, – He's got an incredible memory. He talked at the beginning of the show about like my memory or other people's memory, his wrestling memory. He can remember some of the most bizarre things related to wrestling and names in the sport and, you know, who did this and that and what, and uh, especially guys he coached. If you came through his program, he'll remember who you were, where you were from, your parents' name, like weird, you know, just stuff. I can't, that's how we're different, Jared. I can't, <laughs> after a couple of years, I can't remember where kids were from their high school and, you know, uh, their parents' names sometimes. I mean, you do, but like you have to think about it. He's just, he's like a steel trap when it comes to that stuff. So. Awesome. Well, Jared, we're right at an hour with Coach Pirelli. Coach Pirelli, do you have anything else for us on the Barbarian Hour? Anything, any good stories, anything you want to add before we cut out here? No, it's been a, it's been a good hour. Uh, appreciate you guys having me on. Have me on again. We can talk, we can talk a lot of goofy stuff. I'll tell, uh, Tell a lot of great stories about the old CMU days. Oh man, you guys had excellent squads. I mean, what was it like? Last thing, I guess. I know we got to cut out here, but what was it like being coached by him? Did you feel more pressure being coached by Tom Brilli, the you know legendary coach, as your dad too? Did he did he take the hat off? I'm guessing it never even went to he was like your dad. He was just like your coach. Yeah. No. Um. He he was pretty good about. Um balancing the two like you know around wrestling being wrestling but outside being my dad I I think early in my career I probably took things a lot way too personal and it probably hurt me early and I, I probably didn't get over that until later in my career and I think that's why I started having more success in the latter years of my career is I think that you know when you're young and you're 18 19 or whatever when you're um, just getting started in college you you think that, you know, dad's, you know, my dad and my co he's picking on me and he's singling me out because I, he can, and this, and I didn't realize like, you know, he was being as hard on me as he was on Dave Bulliard, on Jason Mester, on Jordan Webster, you know, he just, he wanted us all to, to reach our full potential and he was going to hold us to a high level. And he, you know, he just was, and, um, I, you know, I just, just used to get a little worked up in my first couple of years. And then over time, um, I think he'll tell you, he actually, um, tried to let like Casey Cunningham and some of the other coaches coach me more because he didn't want me to feel that way. Um, and, um, you know, I just think that, you know, looking back, I wish I would have been a little more mature and, and was able to like, realize like he isn't trying to be hard on me because he's my dad and he can, he's trying to be hard on me because he wants me to be a great wrestler. Right. So. Awesome, man. Thank you for sharing about your dad. I love hearing about, it. I'm trying to get him on. What do you think? You think it's going to happen? Yeah, he'll get on. He, he, uh, think he will? Yeah, he'll do it. I'll tell him to do I it. I love he'll, it. Awesome. Yeah, I had Win on, and Win had nothing but great things to say about him. He's just like, I'm proud to be a Chippewa. I'm proud of that guy. I love that guy. He had nothing but great things to say about your dad. And, and uh, yeah, I've never heard anybody who wrestled for him say a bad thing about him. But, Jared, do we got anything else? Anything we got to read down here? Any any Anybody to shout out or anything? Yeah, no, I just want to say thanks, Jason. Thanks for taking the time. Obviously, check out Barbarian Apparel slash BA Hour. Josh is a busy man this time of year. So so thank you, Jason, for your time tonight, man. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. And for anyone listening, please know that uh, Jared whooped my butt one year back in probably 2002 at 125. Hey, that was it was <laughs> Why not did you only, bring it up. Why did it even have to be brought up? Come on. I, I want everyone to know, hey, I I'm. I'm not above my, uh, my whoopings. I, I know. Um, Neither am I. I you know. <laughs> hey, it was, it was 20, what was that 20 years ago now, maybe ish, roughly 19, yeah, but, <laughs> but like 40 pounds ago for both of us, probably. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he beat, uh, Nick Simmons the same year. Yeah. Who did? Strangler. He split matches with the strangler, but he beat strangler in the, uh, 
dual meet and we won the dual meet. We actually got in a car accident from the dual meet from a bus, a bus to, accident. To, a bus accident from from uh East Lansing to Cent- to Mount Pleasant. Wow. Crazy. It was a bad was, bus accident. I mean it was bad. We were all right, but it was yeah, bad, bad for the people who were in the other vehicle. But guys, thank you for the time. Jason, stick around real quick, all right? Sounds good. 